uh, this series of lessons that we've been encountering. Listening to is called Flawed. It's a study of First Corinthians, uh, the epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and it's uh, quite a book. Thank God for the First Corinthians. Boy, it's going to be a long night. Huh? Well, did, 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 did we get that picture I wanted to put up? You didn't? Oh, no. I think it's on. Well, hold on. I got to show you all this. I, I, I think I emailed it to. Uh, I don't know what I did with it. Y'all got time for this? You want to see it or not? Pass it <laughs> Yeah, we'll pass this around. I'll pick it up after church. It's not on there. It's in. Oh, it's, I sent it to Camille in Slack. Thought it. Well, don't keep my phone, okay? And don't look at my history either. I'm kind of teaching a convicting message tonight. I got to show you this picture. Uh, we're not going to do a, a lot of rehearsing of what uh, Pastor Ryan has already talked about in these lessons, but we do want to share a little bit with you. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the Lord directed Paul to go to the city of Corinth. In Acts 18, 10, and 11, he said, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. I have many people. Somebody say many people. I have many people in this city. And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the Word of God among them. Uh, the book of 1 Corinthians is not really complete without 2 Corinthians because these two epistles are tied together. And there's uh, apparently the city of Corinth was a very large city of about 700,000 people. And the Lord said to Paul, I have many people. I have much people in this city. Have you got it? Did you find it? Okay, if you get it, you you got it, put it up. I want to share this with everybody. There you go. Can I get a witness? <laughs> I even getting this. I'm getting more witnesses from the females than I am the males. Praise God. <laughs> However, the church of Corinth was not an extremely large church, at least in the time that Paul was there, a year and a half. It is estimated that maybe 150 people. Now, the reason they say this is because Paul infers in this epistle that the whole church could come together in one house. So we don't know conclusive how many people were in that church, but here's what we do know. It was a diverse church, very, di very diverse. They had some Jews, 1 Corinthians 7, 18 and 19. They had Gentile converts. Uh, there's several verses that mention that. Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 may, made it clear that the majority of the church Members were socially humble. Some of them were slaves. Uh, Paul also implied in chapter 2 that some of the members were wise or even noble at birth. And an interesting fact, in the book of Romans, chapter 16 and 23, Paul was writing from Romans to Corinth, and he said, Erastus, the city treasurer, sends you greetings. Uh, uh, I mean, he was writing from Corinth to Rome. So apparently they had the city treasurer in the church. So they had this wide spectrum of people, which I think everyone would agree with me 
should be what the church looks like today. People, people at all stages of spiritual growth. But Paul had an issue with Corinth because they were too cozy with the Corinthian culture. They, they weren't separated. They looked a lot like their city. Brother Woodward said, if God could build a church that had much people in Corinth, he could build a church in Fredericton. Well, we'll that's where he lives. We'll change that to Bossier City. If God could build a church in Corinth, he can build one in Bossier City. Can I get a witness from somebody? Now, maybe you would not like to be a member of a church that was like the church at Corinth. Because here's a list of the kinds of people you would be going to church with. Are you ready? This is in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 9 through 11, and I'm reading it to you from the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, commit adultery, Male prostitutes practice homosexuality. They're thieves. They're greedy or drunkards or abusive. They cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. But here's the kicker. He said, some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, over the years, some of you have heard me refer to some people like at a funeral, and I would refer to them as low-maintenance saints. Have y'all ever heard that? I'm waiting. You don't go to funerals, huh? You've heard me refer to someone who passed as a low-maintenance saint. Well, have you ever noticed that I had said that at all memorial services? That was supposed to be funny. I, have I ever got my work cut out for me tonight? Amen. Apparently, Corinth did not have a lot of low-maintenance people. Amen. I, I don't know what's going on in here, but... I have the mic, but that's, oh, you're listening to the sound? I don't know. Oh, there's an alarm going off? There's going to be a bigger alarm going off before I get through this message. Let me, let me just say it to you like this. Pause. Pause, P-A-U-S-E. Paul's letter to Corinth was a rebuke. A strong rebuke, if I might say so. It was not an easy letter for him to write. Apparently, he was answering some questions that some of the people at Corinth had sent to him, and he's responding to these questions. It was such a strong rebuke. It was such a strong rebuke that later in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, and 8, Paul would say, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us any way. In other words, I really did you a service. I did you a favor by sending you this strong rebuke. And it was a strong rebuke. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Uh how would you feel if pastor got up Sunday and said, you're a bunch of carnal people? 
Well, that's what he said to him in the letter. Are you not carnal? And if, if you squeeze Corinthians down, the first Corinthians into one word or one phrase, it's a call for unity. This, this whole epistle is saying, we got to get on the same page. Are you not divided, he said? Part of this was a result of the different social classes in the church. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, you know, and I just put some of some my little personal thoughts in here. By the way, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So be sure and let your pastor know that you appreciate him. I've always tried to be a good pastor. And if the responsibility often left me feeling overwhelmed. I don't want sympathy. I'm on my way out, folks. Give me another 20 years and I'll be in the grave probably or in the rapture. I got invited today to speak at a camp meeting in 2026. I responded and said, if I'm alive and if the rapture hadn't taken place, I'd be honored to come. I've gone on on more than one occasion. I would say many occasions reliving the sermon I preached and thinking, man, they think I was preaching to them and thinking of someone in the church and I said something that didn't have them in my mind, but I'm like, yeah, they probably thought I was, I, 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 I had a weapon up here and I was just preaching to them from the pulpit, which I've never, I've tried not to ever do that. Even though in my younger years, I did that a few times. I thought I could fix people from the pulpit and never did fix anybody really. Uh, just lay awake and worry. I've never, have I ever been mean spirited? I know I've been crazy. There's a difference between mean spirited and crazy, right? Uh, shepherd loves his people. He'll try to find the mind of God and preach what God wants him to preach and lead like God wants him to lead. But I always wanted to please people, and I'm a phlegmatic by birth. If you don't know what that is, that's a peacemaker. And Paul even said, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Brother Tenney used to tell us about a young pastor that took a church that was notorious for running preachers off. And this one guy thought he was going to go down there and change the world. And he called Brother Tenney, and he said, you better be here Wednesday night. I'm resigning. Brother Tenney went into the man's office before church, and his suit coat was laying up on the desk, and he had a piece of mistletoe pinned to the very bottom of the back of his coat, and he's fixing to walk right down the middle aisle and resign. True story. At least Brother Tenney told it for the truth. I don't think he had lied. Uh, but I, I think I can relate to Paul, and that's the reason I'm saying this. Uh, what I'm saying now, not just trying to be crazy, but I don't think the average lay person sitting in a church can ever know the feeling that Paul had, the responsibility. There's an old adage that said a doctor's mistakes go to the grave, an attorney's mistakes go to prison, and a preacher's mistakes go to hell. Amen. Jesus loved the rich young ruler enough to tell him the truth. The Bible said in beholding him, he loved him, and he said, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Do you know what part of that we never get? The come and follow me part. Do you know what Jesus was saying? I'm inviting you to be one of my disciples. He could have been one of the 12. Jesus loved him enough to tell him the truth. So, that's what we all want to be as pastors. And probably sometimes I let my hair down a little too much. I have a reputation for being transparent. Many times I've been too transparent. Um, one of my brothers posted a picture my wife showed me of me and all my other four brothers at a funeral in 1988. And some girl that was in the church that we grew up with made a comment and said she remembered me going to an exclusive restaurant. That tells me the story is not true because I never went to an exclusive restaurant till I was much, much older. But somebody said, pass the ketchup, and I threw the ketchup bottle at him. 
that may or may not be true. I don't know. I, I have no memory of that, but I'm thinking, do you, do you remember that I live for God? Did it ever cross your mind? I was trying. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. But this, <laughs> I'm just going to say this. I don't know if everybody at Corinth was happy with Paul's letter. But Titus came to visit Paul, and he came from Corinth, and he said, I got great news. Because Paul's been like, you know, I was sorry that I wrote you that letter. I spent a year and a half with you. Probably ate with them weekly. Spent time with them weekly. Progress in the kingdom. And he said, Titus came and told me, you repented. So now he's saying, I was sorry I wrote you the letter, but not anymore. Because the letter caused you to repent. It's hard to please all. In fact, it's impossible. Because this church was like any church should be. It had a diversity of people. All social classes contain in this verse that Pastor Ryan has drilled into us in the last few weeks. It's in 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That word expedient means we do have spiritual liberty, as Pastor just drove it home so beautifully last week, just because I can. Because there's a lot of things in the Bible, there's not a end of those. Right? There's only 10 of those. So he said, not everything's lawful for me. I mean, all things are lawful. If I want to find an excuse and talk about I have liberty now and I'm saved by grace, I can do that. But is it good for the body of Christ? Number one, he's asking, am what I am about to do advisable? Number two, he's asking, is what I'm about to do beneficial to the body of Christ? Because we have a responsibility to edify the body. And we'll get into that in 1 Corinthians 12 about spiritual gifts. It's for the purpose of edifying the body. The word edify means to build up. We want to build up the body. And number three, is this constructive for my character? He said, I'm not going to be brought under the power of anything. Is this going to take me closer to God? Or is this going to take me further away from God? Now, that's a good question to ask, isn't it? Is this going to edify the body? Well, years ago, uh, I, all of my brothers at one time were preachers, and there were a few places that did something really crazy. They invited our whole family to come preach, and we, we'd each have a night to preach. And we preached for Brother Paul Hush in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Brother Hush's brother was the man that brought my dad the truth. And th that's a long story. But I never forgot a story Brother Hush told us. He had one of the men on his board was a roofer, and he needed to consult him about something. And he went out to where the man was working, and he, instead of calling the man down, he climbed up on the roof, and he went to the back of the house, and his board member there was with a big cigar in his mouth. Is it lawful? So, yeah, obviously the man's stumbling all over himself, and I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with me just smoking a cigar here, and you know, I don't do this a lot. And, and Brother Hush was telling the story, no, 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 I don't have a problem with it. He said, in fact, I want you to bring it to church Sunday. And I don't want you to sit out in the congregation. I want you to sit on the platform. And he said, when I start preaching, I want you to light it up. Is that good for the body? Is it lawful? You going to go to hell for smoking a cigar? Some of you said yes. Some of you said, I don't know. Some of you said, I hope not. 
And the man's answer, oh, oh, I could never do that. He said, I couldn't do this in the church. And Brother Hush had a great answer. He said, well, you've missed the point of Scripture because the Bible said your body is the temple, not that building. I don't, he didn't finish that story, so I don't know if he helped the man or not. I don't know. So we wouldn't want to do anything at the expense of the church's unity. Can you fathom if some of our young people walked up here to Buffalo Wild Wings and the Tigers were playing Alabama on one Friday night in Death Valley, and I'm sitting at the uh, counter, you know, drinking a beer and watching the ball game, and they come up, and, oh, I, you know, I don't think God's going to penalize me for drinking one beer or two. I'm trying to make a point. These are the questions that Paul is driving home to Corinth. Does this edify the body? You know, I, my guess is that I could probably, I better not say that because you'll go off and tell that I'm smoking cigars, but there are some things that as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we are admonished to do, to, to, we're, we're admonished to be better. Amen? I got to hurry on here. Good night. So is what I'm doing advisable? Is it beneficial for the body? Amen? A little wine for the stomach's sake. Well, you don't want to go to seven and read that verse. Right? You don't want to go to seven and say, hey, God don't care if you drink a little wine. No, I just ruined my life with alcohol. You know, is that beneficial to the body? No. And this is Paul's point that he's making. He can say, well, it don't hurt to drink a little wine. Well, some of them drink a little wine for medicine, you know. And, well, I can drink. No, it's not beneficial to the body. It's going to be closer to God or drive me further away from God. Am I making any sense? All right. In 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, he said, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block. And he said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 25, talking about our personal lives, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. We do this to receive an incorruptible crown. So we're asking, is this a wise thing to do? Amen. All right. There's three more examples that we'll go to real quickly, and I'm kind of spent too much of my time here. Number one, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11, and where Paul addresses the subject of, of coverings on women. Okay, hair coverings, veils, having their head covered. We're going to look at that, and we're going to talk about how it offended their culture. Number two, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11 and 33 and talk about the Lord's Supper a little bit and talk about how this can be offensive to the church family. And then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, spiritual gifts chapter, how this can they think I was talking about. A blizzard. Some things are lost in transition, and we don't understand them. And listen carefully tonight. Maybe God can speak to all of us and help us understand the church is much bigger than me. And this is Paul's point to the church at Corinth. This is not, this is not just about you as individuals. This is about the corporate body of Christ. It's about unity. And here it the Pentecostals of Bossier City, we've never been shy about dealing with scriptures that maybe are difficult to some. We don't have a problem with that. Delving into areas like 1 Corinthians 11, we don't have an issue looking at that. Some people don't understand it, so they just bury it. We're not going to do that. If it's difficult or demanding, we still want to look at it, right? Now, I want to say this, Christianity and if you don't know this, this is a powerful statement. Christianity did more to liberate women than any other religion in the world. In the body of Christ, Paul said there's neither male nor female. And I know there are some organizations that do not allow women to speak in the pulpit and say that it's forbidden for a woman to teach. Paul said if a woman pray or prophesieth with her head uncovered, it's a shame. So obviously they had women saying something in the church. They weren't always 
silent. But even in our world today, you know this, there are many cultures that demand of their women that they wear a head covering, a veil. When Paul addresses the subject to Corinth, he is it's like the blizzard, the Dairy Queen blizzard and, and the snow, okay? They know what he's talking about. We didn't live there. We didn't know their culture. So we can read right past this. But the only people, the only women in Corinth who were permitted to go outside without a veil were the temple prostitutes. The temple prostitutes shave their heads. This is females. They shave their heads in some way that was supposed to honor their God. And so when they walked through the city, right, people knew what they were. Well, apparently there were some women in Corinth who had a newfound liberty, and they didn't want to wear a head covering because we're saved by grace now. And God looks on the inside. He don't look out on the outside. And Paul is saying to them, if you do this, you're not representing the body of Christ in this city. Because when other, other people outside the church look at you, what do they think? They think it's a temple prostitute. That's what they think. So Paul goes on, and this is not an exhaustive study on this subject. Uh, but Paul goes on to say to them, he's first talking about a veil. He said in verse 5 of 11, For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And he's relating to the temple prostitute. She's not covered. She shaved her head. He said she might as well be shaved. If she's not going to wear a veil, she might as well shave her head. And then when you get down to verse uh, 1 Corinthians 11, is it, is it uh, I don't, I've, I've got my scripture wrong. Uh, Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered is on with her head, for, even, for that is even as one as if she were shaven. This could go a long ways, even in our city. It, it, it's much bigger than the subject of why are women wear long hair. Much bigger. It could apply to insignificant things in your life, the way you treat a waitress, the anger you display at a business when they didn't fix your car. Got a amen, and a that's right. That's all I got. Because when you get on this subject, for Corinthians 11, it gets so quiet in here, you can hear a mouse licking on ice. We don't back up from these scriptures because we may not understand them. And what I want to show you here is Paul is saying, does that make sense to you that Paul is saying, you shave your head and go around this city, everybody thinks you're a temple prostitute. And then you come to church with us and worship. He said, if you pray or prophesy with your head uncovered, it's a shame to you. Romans 11, uh, 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen 15 said, If a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And what Paul does here, he goes from culture to eternity. He talks about a cultural issue. Now he's going to move to an eternal issue. And he goes back to the beginning, man and woman in the beginning. And he goes into a lesson about submission. If a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. Somebody say it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. When he talks about long hair, somebody say long hair, you can study the word. I did it today again, which I've done many times before, because I don't want to preach for doctrine a commandment of men. You can study it. It means to let your hair grow. That's what the word means. If a woman has long hair, let the hair grow. And then he goes on to say, for this cause, ought a woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So he moves from cultural to eternal. He moves from a city of Corinth issue to a God-given principle, the principle of submission, and said in verse 14, does not even nature teach you that if a woman have long hair, it is a, 
If a man have long hair, it is a shame to him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And here is a verse that I love in 1 Corinthians 10. For this cause, for what cause? That a woman has long hair, showing that she submitted. He said, for this cause ought a woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Somebody said, what angels is that? Fallen angels or God's angels? I think it's both. Because when a woman is under submission, as Paul instructed them to be, the angels see that. She should have power on their head. And I don't want any of you males to take offense to this, but I've never known men who could pray like women. And I've known some great praying men. But I've never known men who could travail in prayer like a woman can. And I think it goes back to this verse right here. Are you all okay? It's a picture of a godly woman with restraint. And I told you that Paul is saying all this because this is a book about coming together, being united. And he says in verse 16, if any man seem to be contentious, that word means a strife lover, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, we're not arguing about this. This is what he's saying. We don't have this custom. Now, I've, I've, I've run out of time, and I've got to go to the Lord's Supper because this is a good one. This is, this, this is, Paul rebukes them for the way they're partaking in communion. And it's a strong rebuke. And it is such a strong rebuke that he said, there are people in your midst that are sick and dead because of the way you do communion. That is a sobering thought. For this cause, many of you are sick and some have fallen asleep. Wow. That ought to be a wake-up call. You mean Uncle Joe died because of the way we were doing communion? Ain't Skinny died because of the way we are doing communion? That was a lady in one of our churches. That's a frightening thought. Because they had social classes in the church. And I called a, a friend last week after the Bible study last week. He's not, I was so curious about this. Uh, when when Pastor Ron was talking about us being united and coming together, and I was already looking ahead, and and uh, this is basically what happened. And, and Pastor talked last week about buying meat that was sacrificed to idols and bringing it. You had some people who were slaves who didn't have money to buy nice food. And I'm going to paraphrase this tonight, but I'm right about what I'm paraphrasing. And you had some wealthy people who could bring a feast. You know, there are some people who ask you out to eat, you're probably going to go to Poncho's, you know. And there are some people who say, we'll take you to eat tonight, you're going to Two John's. You ready? So they had this, they had this in the church in Corinth. They had wealthy people who could bring a lot of food. They called them love feasts. The whole church came together. We called them potlucks. There's a reason they call them pot luck, because it is luck. But what would happen, the people that had more would get there first with their f food, and they'd eat it all, and some of them were already drunk. He said, some of you are drunken. They're BWW. They're wild wings watching the tigers, and they're drunk. Now, that I made that part up. So they're not united. And he said, do you, not have, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Why are you doing this in the, in the house of God? Now, they used to scare us to death when we did communion. Some of you long-timers, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Brother, if you eat and drink of this unworthily, you're probably going to get run over by an 18-wheeler when you walk out of here tonight. Well, you talk about some soul searching and repenting and a little boy doing communion. In fact, there were a few times I said, I don't want to do communion. I was scared to death. And, and, uh, but 
uh, Paul is not telling him not. He said, this is what I got from the Lord. The Lord told me this. He didn't get it from Peter and John who were at the Last Supper. He said, the Lord gave it to me. The Lord told me that he wants us to do this, to remember his death. And yet you got these classes in the church. You got the big eyes and the little you got slaves, and you got the city treasurer, and the people who have more are getting all the food and eating it. And you got the stragglers coming in, there ain't nothing left. Picking up a few chicken bones and this is a call for unity in the body of Christ. Your brothers and sisters, and you prefer one another. And this, again, this cannot be an exhaustive study, but uh, let me just give you this, 1 Corinthians 11, 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? I don't praise you in this. I'm not excited you told me we had a great Lord's Supper service because you're divided. You got classes of people, and he was against it. Now, Paul said in verse 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Somebody say those last words with me, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That's a reference to death. Many, somebody say many, are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now, the King James Version says, who and eats and drink, who, he who eats and drinks unworthily. That is not the same as unworthy. That's why the New King James Version translates this word unworthy. None of us are worthy. All right? I'll never be worthy enough, unworthily, because we're not discerning the Lord's body. Look across this congregation right now. Would you do that? Look around. Look around. You're looking at the Lord's body. You're looking at the body of Christ. Did that make sense? You don't discern the Lord's body. You're jumping in line. I got, I got a great son-in-law. He drives me crazy sometimes, and I wish somebody would text him and tell him I said that. I'm just kidding. But but if, if, if he comes to eat at our house for Christmas, do you want to know who's first through the line? And he eats like a jackrabbit. I mean, he's, he's, he's finished with his plate, and I'm just getting to the table. Well, he would have went well with the Corinthian church. He jumped in line, got his plate full. Talked about how good it was, got him a cup of coffee, and then said, when are we going to have dessert? I haven't eaten my turkey yet. He said, you'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I hope you remember this the next time you come. And you saw that list of people I read about first, right? You saw that. It's people at all stages of growth in the body of Christ. But remember, in Christ, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. There's no male, there's no female. God don't look at us that way. God don't look at you at where you are and judge you. He looks at where you've been. He wants to know if you're making progress. That's what discipleship is all about. He spent three and a half years with the disciples, and they still had a long way to go. Can you imagine being with Jesus three and a half years? And then right before he dies, having a fuss about who's the greatest in the kingdom? Can you fathom? I can't fathom that. These, these uh, We did that first word about disciples, and it helped me a lot to realize these guys were teenagers because teenagers really don't have brains. And I told you, Christianity did more to elevate women than any other religion. 
they're not in 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 times past in the old world women were almost looked at as property they want to do reparations they ought to give some to the women that didn't go over very good you didn't pick who you were going to marry your mom and daddy picked them out i still wish we had that rule i'm just kidding We got, well, I'll close with this. Spiritual gifts is 743 for those of you who are watching your clock. Uh, spiritual gifts. And we don't have time to go through the spiritual gifts. But Paul said there's many gifts, but there's one spirit. Diversities of gifts, but we only have one spirit. The gifts of the spirit are not so you can blow your horn. They're only given to the church to edify the body of Christ. Did you hear what I said? To be used in the gifts of the Spirit, the purpose of being used in the gifts of the Spirit, and places, but they are for the edification of the body. It, that's what it's for. Can I just say it this way? It's to make us a better church. That's why we have the gifts of the Spirit. Not so we can say, oh, he was used in tongues and he was used in interpretation and did it edify the body? I have heard some interpretations that did not edify the body. I have heard some interpretations of tongues that did not make one bit of sense. There was a man who was giving out an interpretation of a tongue, and he got all twisted up, had his eyes closed. He was at the front, fell over the altar, rolled on his back, and didn't make a hill of beans worth sense. And the church was standing there like, oh, my God, what, what's next? And he spoke up again and said, thus saith the Lord, that which thou hast just heard was not me. It was my humble servant. Paul emphasizes in 1 Corinthians 12, please hear this. Some members of the body are essential, though they're never seen. That call for teacher Sunday are just as essential. It may not be. There's, there's diversities of gifts. One of the gifts is administrations. There are diversities of gifts. There is a gift, I believe, of servanthood. We had a family come to this church, and I won't tell you who they are, but they're sitting here tonight, several years ago. And I said, we want you to get involved in, in the church. Where do you want to go to work? What would you like to do? And they said, put us in the kitchen. I like to fell out of my chair. I've been pastoring all my blooming life. I've never heard anybody say, put me in the kitchen. And then this is what they said. That's where we're most comfortable. You know what that is? That's a gift. Oh, but that's not a supernatural gift. I don't know. They may be just as essential as somebody giving out a prophecy. No member of the body is unimportant. Every member of the body is important. And Paul calls them little members like your little toe, your little finger, whatever, you know. You're important to the body of Christ. And that's what spiritual gifts are about. Could you stand with me? It's 11, it's 747. I ought to have told you it's 830 and watch you freak out. But amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. You remember that old song, you're my brother, you're my sister, take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. Speak it out, sister. I don't know. There's so much truth in that song. Together. Somebody say together. All right, look at five people and say, I just want you to know I'm in your family. Now look at somebody else and say, you probably look like a little toe to me, but you're important to me. You're important in the body of Christ.